family. Happy um, New Year. <laughs> Welcome to 2020. What's up? I am really, um, I'm happy to be here tonight, you guys. Um, I am all over the place. And hey, Barry, Happy New Year, my friend. How are you, sir? You are the first one through the door. You need to get like a special um, cup. I don't know, something uh, for being the first one through, <laughs> through the door. I appreciate you. I, um, I am just, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be in 2020. I'm happy to be with you. And um, I am just wired for sound right now. So um, I'm going to share this you know what I do. On my other pages, Sergeant Dorsey Speaks on Facebook. I'm sharing it on retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey on Facebook. And then, of course, you know, I'll eventually upload this onto YouTube for my subbies. So let me just take a moment and say um, hello to my subbies. I um, am going to be posting a lot of stuff going forward. I am going to be... Um, now, for those of you who don't know, I'm on Instagram because that's where the young people are. And, you know, the young people need to hear what I'm saying, too, right? Those are the ones who, you know, can get got <laughs> if they're not careful. And so I want to make sure that I reach as many people as I can in 2020. At the end of every year, I always think about, OK, what could I do differently? What can I do better? Um, yeah. So Instagram it is. I'm doing it for the gram now. And so I will be uploading, because I'm limited on Instagram, I can only do a 15 minute video. So that means, you know, 14 minutes and 99, 59 seconds. Yeah, <laughs> not 99 seconds. Yeah, so I can only do 15 minutes. So um, that means I gotta talk fast and I gotta, you know, say everything that I wanna say. Hey, Larry, happy uh, new year, sir. Hey, Mama Lindy, Happy New Year. I um, decided when I go on Instagram, because there's so much to talk about, and listen, I found a new gift that keeps on giving y'all, Vallejo, the city of Vallejo, California. Ooh wee, I am um, in contact with some folks on the ground there, a uh, family of a young man, Willie McCoy, who was shot and killed tragically last year um, by Vallejo PD. And when I tell you Vallejo is off the chain, I have... I, I've never seen anything quite like it. And so, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna get that big old elephant in Vallejo and we just gonna take little bitty bites out of that thing <laughs> until we get it all gone. And part of what we're gonna be doing is, uh, you know, just showcasing and highlighting, not allowing Vallejo PD to operate in a vacuum because that's what they've been doing. This is a small department, about 103 officers and they have about 14, which we are hashtagging, we are calling them, we have given them the name, the Fatal 14. If you go over to YouTube, you will be able to listen to a um, segment that I did on Vallejo PD and more specifically talked about uh, an investigation that was done by NBC in the Bay Area where they talked about these 14 officers on this police department who are just wreaking havoc. And listen, they so bold with it in Vallejo you mess around and complain, you try to, you know, stomp around in Vallejo, they'll come and sit outside of your house. They will shine lights up on your um, windows that face the street to try to intimidate the families who've lost loved ones who, you know, have something to say about it. It's your right. And so they try to intimidate folks in Vallejo. So we're just not going, we're not going to let that happen. Uh, they're not going to be able to do that in a vacuum. And so I don't know, you know, how crazy it's going to get, but I really do need two or three to you to stand in a group with me. Keep a sister in prayer because while I don't live in Vallejo, I don't have any plans of going to Vallejo, but you know, they got family down here that could come looking for me. <laughs> if I spark their competitive spirit. So um, I need you guys to, um, you know, keep me in prayer because listen, Everybody is not excited about what it is that I do and uh, what it is that I say. So, um, you know, I understand that and I recognize that when I first started speaking. And so, um, you know, with all of that in mind, hey, um, Ezel, what's up? With all of that in mind, I am not going to be deterred. Uh, I am not, um, you know, thin skinned and so sticks and stones, you know what's up. 
I have no fucks to give. <laughs> if I could just say that about uh, whoever may be bothered by um, this posture that I'm going to be taking on this police department, specifically on behalf of the family of Willie McCoy. So um, I'll be doing, you know, one story, just one story, because that's about all I can get in in 15 minutes. Because, you know, once I get to rambling and yammering, 15 minutes comes and goes. And I have the benefit on YouTube, on uh, Instagram of doing something that I can't do here, because I don't know how, <laughs> on Facebook, understanding that Instagram and Facebook are owned by Zuckerberg, but I don't know how to do it on here. I figured it out on uh, Instagram because I'm uploading. I'm not live yet, um, but I will be going live from time to time with uh, one of my um, partners in crime, Joe Estead. And so let me just say, Joe, thank you, sir. I appreciate you, my brother in blue. Um, founder of Police Brutality Matters. We're going to be raising hell in 2020 together. And so I'm going to be following his lead over on the gram because he's been doing it a little bit longer than me. And um, like I said, I'm just going to showcase one story. I'll, I'll include a little video clip because I learned how to do that too in 2020. So uh, I can show the video and, and then give a little narration on Instagram. So even if you guys, you know, don't get the gram and you don't really, you know, want to spend a whole lot of time there, if you would, if you could, please, I ask for very little. Could you just go over to Instagram and create an account and then follow Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey on Instagram? Because you guys know, um, I see all those hearts and I appreciate it, y'all. But listen, I need numbers. Opportunities come more time on Instagram comes when, you know, they see folks are listening, uh, folks are following. So I need you um, to just slide over, you know, once or twice a week and just like a video, hook a sister up. I appreciate it. For those of you who are here for the first time in 2020, I am Cheryl Dorsey, a retired 20-year veteran sergeant of the Los Angeles Police, De Police Department, having spent all 20 years in patrol as a police officer and as a patrol sergeant. I come to you weekly and now kind of every other day with um, just my own personal insights based on my 20 years in patrol training, um, common sense, because, you know, that's helpful if you have a little, with regards to things that are making national news. And so there's some stuff that I want to talk to you about um, that's making national news. And be ready, buckle in, Vallejo PD. You will be hearing a lot about that because, like I said, um, there's a lot going on in Vallejo. And there is a report that um, me and some of the others are going to endeavor to get, which speaks specifically to this uh, investigation regarding these officers. And listen, like I said, it's, it's only 14 of them, but there have been like 200 uses of force uh, by these 14 officers, um, several fatalities, broken bones, concussions, fractures. Yeah, it's a lot going on. And so I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to give the people what they want. Evidently, if you're cutting up in Vallejo, you must want folks to talk about it. So that's what I mean to do in 2020. For those of you who really, you know, appreciate me and what I do, and I can see because I see all the hearts, um, there's a couple of ways that you can support Sergeant Dorsey in 2020. So why don't we just up that just a smidge as well? Sergeant Dorsey has a cash app where you can go and uh, support the show. And if you don't just want to give me money so I can go to Popeye's and get a $6 sandwich, you can go to my website, www.sergeantcherylldorsey.com and purchase my book, or you can purchase it on sergeantdorseyspeaks.com. Two places, two websites, ooh wee, uh, three, four social media platforms. I'm OCD, so I can't do anything just on one platform. So you can buy my book in a couple of different places, sergeantdorseyspeaks.com, sergeantcherylldorsey.com. And when you go to both, um, specifically when you go to sergeantcherylldorsey.com, listen, I want you to know what you're buying. So you can read the entire, the entire, who does that but me? the entire first chapter of my autobiography, Black and Blue, The Creation of a Social Advocate. Now, you know, in Black and Blue, I talk about um, my career on LAPD and I talk about, you know, instances and folks. Um, some of you may recognize I use their real names in some instances and in other instances I use pseudonyms. 
you know how I like to do it, right? Like little Tink Tink and the Christian. I do the same thing in my autobiography. Um, but you'll be able to see kind of what it was like to be me on the LAPD at a time when white boys didn't really want me to be there. And not much has changed. I talked a little bit about that on my podcast, which dropped on Tuesday for those of you who missed it, who haven't subscribed, who aren't following Sergeant Dorsey Speaks on the podcast platform of your choice. I talked about an incident involving some female police officers on the NYPD. There's about 500 of them who may be um, involved in what I guess could wind up being like a class action lawsuit because why the men on the NYPD are not um, empathetic, are not understanding. They don't really give a damn about women who are coming back to work after having given birth and all of the, the trials and tribulations that go along with being a nursing mother at work. And so um, there's a lawsuit on the NYPD. And um, I was just kind of taken aback to know that all these many years later, not like I didn't know, but, you know, to see it again in print is kind of triggering sometimes, right? When you've been through, you know, some stuff and you see stuff is still going on and you're like, what? Um, yeah, so, you know, I went through it on uh, LAPD looking like I do and just being me <laughs> uh, in the 80s not wanting to conform, uh, not trying to fit that mold. Yeah, I got to be me, right? And so, you know, sometimes, you know, that came with a cost, and but it was all good. It's still going on. 2020, well, 2019, female officers on a major metropolitan police department like the NYPD are not being dealt with in a way that, um, you know, is fair, right, and just. And so now there's a lawsuit because that's the only thing, you know, these big police departments understand are lawsuits. And so, again, I'm believing that, you know, you should give the people what they want. And so um, don't get mad, get paid, right? Anyway, having said all of that, thank you for being here. And so let's get to it. You know, I talked about this uh, on a previous show, and I'm just going to have to call it a show now because I don't know if it was YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. But I talked about this police officer on the NYPD, speaking of NYPD, his name is Mark J. Reynolds. And Mark J. Reynolds was cutting up in Tennessee. He had gone to a bachelor uh, party and he had rented an Airbnb. Long story short, talked about it on the podcast, I believe. Um, he got drunk, wandered off from his Airbnb and wound up at another neighboring Airbnb residence, if you will. And he got into it with a black woman who was staying there with her children and he wound up breaking in. He called her the N word and, you know, was really a problem. So much so that he wound up being arrested. Now they didn't arrest him that night because, you know, it was Tennessee and, you know, I guess that's how they get down. But eventually they did arrest him. He served, I think it was about two weeks in jail, a slap on the wrist, an insult given what he was engaged in as a police officer, drunk in public, threatening this woman, terrorizing her. Because listen, you try to break into a white woman's house, kick in the door <laughs> and see what they do to you. They'll slap you with terrorist threats and racial, you know, hate crime. Oh boy, got the homie hookup. He wound up doing two weeks and three years probation. So, and Mark J. Reynolds is still patrolling over in um, New York. I think it's Manhattan is where he works. So um, change.org has created a petition. And so far, the last I saw, there were about 10,000 people who had signed this online petition. So if you want to, um, you know, sign the petition, I I'll just go ahead and share the, the link with you um, so that you can, you can sign. Um, you can sign this petition. And, um, but here's the thing I'll share, I'll share a couple of sentences with you here on uh, Facebook subbies. Um, I'll put it in the description for you to check it out later. If you want the link to the change.org petition, but anyway, so, um, they're, they're looking for signatures. They have about 10,000. Their goal is 15,000. Here's my thing. Um, you know, while writing and signing petitions are all great and good, but at the end of the day, you know, I tell you all the time, police departments are publicity averse. 
And so, um, again, everybody ought to just have a Twitter account just so you can go and pick at them, right? Just so you could go and poke the bear and tweet about things that are problematic and that are um, happening that you want to get someone's attention about. So um, they're asking that this officer be fired because listen, if you are on duty or off duty and you're using uh, racial epithets, if you're calling folks the N word, then that means he probably got a problem with black and brown folks, right? And if he got a problem with them off duty, he gonna have a problem with them on duty. So why are we gonna wait until NYPD officer Mark J. Reynolds seriously hurts someone, maims them, or kills them. Because we already know he don't like black folks, for real, for real. And so um, I think, you know, you guys, I'm asking you, call to action. This is an ask. Reach out to this new commissioner over there. His name, his name is Dermot Francis Shea, Commissioner Shea on the NYPD, because remember, uh, you know, back on, I think it was December 1st or 2nd when he first got appointed and he, with great grandfare, made a public proclamation that his officers will be respected and that um, he's going to demand it. Now, I don't know how he makes people respect officers who don't um, make people respect his officers when his officers don't respect the community, but that was what he said. And so again, I'm believing him, I'm taking him at his word. Well, it's a two-way street. Uh, Commissioner Shea, respect. And so when you have an officer who's disrespectful, off duty, I can only imagine what he does when he puts on that uniform and, you know, he becomes Billy Badass, super cop, right? So uh, reach out to uh, Commissioner Dermot Francis Shea on the NYPD and um, reach out to the CRB, the Civilian Review Board over there, because we know when the Civilian Review Board gets involved, stuff happens, right? Remember, it was the Civilian Review Board that lit that fire under the other commissioner who they banished to the cornfield because he, um, because they recommended that Daniel Pantaleo be fired, not because he choked Eric Garner, not because the hole was prohibited, but because the Civilian Review Board found out he lied. So maybe we ought to just reach out to that Civilian Review Board. I don't know how many members are on it, but I'm sure, you know, with a little bit of time and patience, you guys could Google it and get their names, um, find their public uh, social media accounts, email addresses, and um, maybe just send over a copy of that change.org petition saying that this guy needs to go. Because again, he's uh, shown us who he is, Mark J. Reynolds. Uh, and... Um, is that right? Did I say his name right? Yeah, Mark J. Reynolds. So let's not wait for him to kill somebody and then act all surprised, you know, because he told us who he is. So that's that. There was something else that was circulating uh, over in West Virginia, the governor, Governor Justice. He just approved the firing of every employee who was involved in some kind of a Nazi salute. You probably saw the picture on Facebook. I know I saw it shared several times where it was a group of uh, trainees. It was about 30 of them who had just graduated and dumbasses. Instead of them getting their little police hats and throwing them up in the air, they decided to do the old uh, Hitler salute. And um, so now it's um, the picture's gone public and it says the West Virginia Department of Military Affairs and Public Safety um, are involved. And this uh, basic training class 18 is the number, I guess. Basic training class number 18. Well, they're going to have to find another basic training class because they just showed all of them the door. Stupid. I guess they didn't realize, you know, just because you graduate from the police academy or basic training, you're not quite yet vested, dumb, dumb. Either they missed that part of the training. They sure told us when I was on the LAPD about what not to do while you're still on probation. Uh, either they weren't paying attention or they just said, you know what, because a little tink tink and, you know, he's constantly, um, you know, showing and telling us that we can, you know, show our ass in public. So they showed their ass in public. Well, in addition to the entire uh, basic training class that got fired, there were two training instructors uh, who was fired as well. And then 
um, there were some other people who um, were somehow involved that have been suspended without pay. So there's a whole lot of openings over there um, in Virginia if you guys are looking to be the police. And, you know, I'm, I'm encouraging everyone, you know, if you got issues, if you got beef, like a lot of people do who go to jail and are wrongly accused, they go back to school and they become attorneys. If you got beef with the police, I need you to be a mole. Who wants to be a mole? You need to get on that department. You need to be part of the solution, right? Because they're certainly on there. They're recruiting them. They're joining in groups of 34. We know because we just saw 34 of them give that special salute. So uh, yeah, we need to be on the job too. And listen, I know um, for you know those of you that are going to say FTP and all that, I know it's difficult. I know that, um, you know, there are obstacles that are put in our way, but we got to do it because listen, if we don't, then we really have no one to blame and nothing to complain about. Okay. Um, over in Portland, Portland police, they have a new chief, sister girl, 43 years old, Daniel, Danielle outlaw leaving Portland take that back. She's not a police chief in Portland. She was the police chief in Portland. Now she's headed over to Philadelphia. And you know what a shit show that was over there on uh, the Philadelphia Police Department. So she's going over there, a lot of sexual harassment stuff going on. Um, you know, they thought they had a commissioner in uh, Joe Fitzgerald from Houston, and then that fizzled out and then, you know, it was a mess. So now they have Danielle Outlaw from, um, from um, Portland. And so here's the deal, because, you know, when I was reading the story, I was really like reading, you know, between the lines. And I just want to share with you because, you know, I want to support the sister. I really do. You guys know all skin folk and kin folk. I say that regularly, and it, it pains me to have to say that because by and large, and I'm not saying to everybody, but listen, when you get up there and you start breathing that special air, you almost have to just make a deal with the devil. I know that there are some progressive black um, administrators. I just haven't really seen one. I haven't met one. I didn't ever work for one. I'm just saying. So I don't really know, you know, what this girl's, uh, this woman's situation is. But what I do know is I almost feel like they're really setting her up to fail. And because of everything that's gone on over there in Philadelphia, I think that they are putting someone who looks like me and some of you uh, up front so they can say, look, what, what? We just hired a black woman as a chief. I mean, right? Because when she was on the Portland Police Department as their chief, according to one of the commissioners, and there's an article that speaks to this, she really didn't get a lot of support. She came from um, Oakland, I believe. I believe she came from Oakland to Portland, and now she's going from Portland to Philadelphia. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. It says that uh, she rose through the ranks quickly on the Oakland Police Department. So then that causes me some concern because understand when they say she rose through the ranks quickly that means she spent very little time in patrol and so you know we all are a little bit um feeling ourselves if i could say that right as a as a ground pounder as a patrol officer as a patrol supervisor i absolutely i absolutely uh think i'm the shit <laughs> Because patrol is the backbone of every police department. We make stuff happen. If we don't make arrests, it's nothing for detectives to go detect, right? We do the in initial investigation and then they follow up after we've corralled and gathered up all the witnesses for the homicides. You know how we do when we get you guys all together and put you in a little bus and take you to the station and you know hold you for hours and hours so that the detectives can come in from home because they just woke up and and ask you a bunch of questions that you don't want to answer patrol makes that happen so the fact that she rose through the ranks quickly makes me think that she was probably an administrator way way longer than she was a patrol officer supervisor and so you know a lot of people i think my own personal opinion is that 
folks think because you're a police chief or because you're a sheriff, somehow you know more. But listen, I can tell you, I've been in a lot of foot pursuits and I was never in one with a lieutenant <laughs> or a captain. Now, I get that, you know, certain departments are different and somewhere there may be a sheriff running eastbound through the houses chasing a, a BFMV suspect, burglary for motor vehicle, GTA suspect, Grand Theft Auto. I just personally ain't never seen a captain do that. So uh, again, rolls through the ranks quickly. I don't know what she really knows about patrol. Um, she may be an amazing administrator, but I think um, the fact that she has so little support and a lot of the stuff that she was trying to do over on Portland wasn't getting done by um, the admission of one of the female councilwomen over there. Portland had a thousand um, members on their police department. And it says during the two and a half years that she was there, you know, there was a lot of community uh, mistrust and there were a lot of protests. So, again, I hate to not support her. I just don't know if we could really trust her. So I'm come from a place of, you know, everybody's an ass until you show me you're not. Don't judge me. Uh, I don't know if we can trust her family is, is all I'm saying. Um, it says here that when she got over to Portland, as an outsider coming from Oakland, it says that she struggled to gain acceptance and support. And this is acceptance and support internally. It says within the police bureau, within city hall, and then of course, within the community. So listen, if she was struggling to gain acceptance and support for the two years that she was there, she's gonna be an outsider again, going to Philadelphia, how long is she going to struggle to gain acceptance and support within that police bureau? I guess we'll have to wait and see. It says um, that as an outsider, being asked to change the culture of the Portland Police Bureau required a Herculean effort as well as a support team, which Danielle Outlaw never found, according to a councilwoman. She never found it. So um, again, I don't know if she's gonna have a support team when she gets over to Philly, I don't know. The same councilwoman, her name is Hardesty. She said, chiefs will come and go, but it's the culture that they leave behind that matters the most. And so, um, you know, sounds like she didn't really change that culture. And then when I was reading the article, it was like a little dig, you know, that they gave to her because it says that under outlaw, the police bureau lowered its hiring standards to try to attract more applicants to fill the growing number of vacancies in the authorized force of 1001. So they lowered the, the standards, according to them, um, because of Danielle Outlaw. She asked them, she requested, she made it happen so that they could hire people who, who what, aren't qualified. So what does that mean? Does that mean, I'm deciphering police code talk for you family. Does that mean that, um, if there's an errant or rogue cop over there because they lowered the standards because Danielle had them do that, does she get blamed for that now that she's gone? I don't know. I'm just asking, I'm just saying, what do you guys think? Do you think that they're setting her up for failure over there in Philly? You know, um, I don't know. It also said in this same article that, um, you know, she was a little frustrated. She was in, involved in something that had to do with mental illness. And it says that she hired a team of overseers because there was a Justice Department settlement that was requiring the Portland Police Department to do some stuff. And so she hired this group of overseers and I think it involved some community members and uh, they were supposed to do something that had to, to uh, do with addressing what they called a pattern of excessive force against people with mental illness. Now, whatever it was she was asking this group to set up, they did. However, it has not been agreed upon just yet because it's gonna require uh, input from a judge. And um, some of the other changes that she was asking for while she was there was um, regarding use of force uh, policies, training and oversight. So she tried to do all of that to no avail. Because why? Because she didn't have the support of the Bureau. 
not getting the support of the Bureau. So they say, here you go, Missy. We're going to send you from this thousand member police department in Portland over to Philadelphia where shit is all the way fucked up. <laughs> all the way. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. I just feel like they are setting her up to fail. And it reminds me, you know, on LAPD, when Willie Williams came here, I think he came from Philly too, um, somewhere on the East Coast when Willie Williams came. And, you know, he, I, I felt like he was set up to fail. He was the first black police chief. And, oh, we don't get me started about that because, you know, that was a whole thing when they didn't give it to Bernard Parks, who had grown up on the LAPD. And, uh, you know, LAPD divided right down the middle. Bernard had a camp. Willie Williams had a camp. But he was an outsider, and he, he didn't know LAPD, he didn't know our culture, he didn't, he didn't know nothing. That's why he was a one-term chief, and then, of course, Mayor Reardon didn't like him, and then he wouldn't stay out of Vegas, so I felt like they set Willie Williams up to fail, just so they could say we had one, and then, um, you know, when they showed him the door, they, um, you know, had one more, Bernard Parks, and so, uh, you know, that, that won't happen again. <laughs> in this century, I'm sure. So uh, Philadelphia is is uh, allegedly the fourth biggest um, in the country. 6,500 sworn members, 800 civilian. So she's going from a thousand member department to a 6,500 sworn, 800 civilian. And, you know, problems. She's inheriting problems involving sexual harassment. Maybe that's why they wanted a female. She may do very well with that. But, oof, sister girl, men, yeah, um, I don't know. I wish her well. I wish her well. I, I don't, um, you know, I, I'm not hoping that she doesn't succeed. I just hope she's smart about it, and I hope she has a team around her, which makes me um, think of, Vallejo PD and what's going on over there because they too have a new police chief. They just got one in, in September. Brother man, his name is Shawnee Williams. He too came from Oakland. So there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of shift in the Oakland police. And I, it's not all for the good. I'll be talking about that on Instagram. But um, Vallejo has a new police chief and you know they brought him over there because he looked like me and some of you to say we want to do things better here in uh, Vallejo. And if you've been to my Instagram, you've already heard me talk about the city manager. That city manager, the police chief serves at the pleasure of the city manager. And when uh, this interview that he did regarding this investigation and the fatal 14 who've been involved in all this mayhem, he said, listen, I go to community meetings and, you know, it may be one or two people that complain, but... By and large, you know, I mean, if somebody's not happy with the police department, you know, that would be a problem, but it ain't mine. <laughs> it might be yours. That's the city manager who just hired Shawnee Williams. So you already know he's just going to be a figurehead. He's just going to be somebody sitting in a seat with somebody else's hand up his nether regions, moving his mouth. Because as soon as he comes in there and start dealing with those white boys on Vallejo, the fatal 14, and that's just the 14 that we know about because they've been involved in a variety, repetitive use of force, deadly force. I'm sure there's more than 14, but those are the ones that are the most over the top. So if uh, Shawnee Williams come in there trying to do something with the fatal 14, I don't believe the city manager is here for that. I don't think he's going to be having any of that. So again, um, maybe they brought Shawnee over to, you know, set him up to fail. I'll be watching Vallejo because I'm going to be paying very close attention. I'm going to be talking a lot, a lot, a lot about the fatal 14. You'll hear that term. We just decided, um, folks, I'm working with David Harrison cousin to uh, Willie McCoy came up with the whole idea of creating the hashtag fatal 14, because what I want to do, what I'd like to do with them going forward is see if we can't get this fatal 14 off the department. There was one guy who did, uh, you know, get shown the door last year. He had only been on the department a couple of years and had killed three people. And he, in this interview, 
that you can see on Instagram, he says, hey, everybody who knows me knows that I'm a good officer. You know, they know that, you know, I, I, I got a bad rap because I'm aggressive. Code talk for he likes to kick ass and take names. He says, I work in a high risk unit. Dude, miss me. I worked in high risk units too, South Bureau Crash back when crash was really crash before the rampart scandal mumbo jumbo because that wasn't really crash i worked south bureau crash and uh i shot no one i had folks run for me i had folks fight me guys and girls i shot no one i took people to jail who were involved in felonies and misdemeanors and drunk driving and assault on a police officer me <laughs> And I shot no one. So for him to say that I was in a high risk unit and somehow that explains why he had to shoot three people is insulting. And that means he's learned nothing. And because California is one of the few states where you can uh, be fired or be shown the door and not lose your sort of certification by post, you can go get a job somewhere else. And I bet you he will because elephant hunters always, always land on their feet. And so that too is something that I'm going to be uh, suggesting and saying, and you will hear more of this um, in the future, because listen, I'm not just coming to you and telling you stuff's messed up, you already know. What I want you to do in 2020 is something different than what we've been doing is just fussing about it and say things are not gonna be um, any better, things are not gonna change. Uh, this is just what the condition is, and we have to live with it. What I want each and every one of you to do who hears my voice, and that's why I want you to share what I'm talking about on your timeline so that other people can hear what it is that I'm saying. And that's why I want you to follow me on YouTube, Sergeant Dorsey Speaks, and follow me on Instagram, Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey, so that others can hear what it is we need to do. And what we need to do is once you identify an errant officer, He's got to go. And the pressure has to come from the community. It has to come through uh, letters, um, change.org, petitions, being available and present at community meetings, voicing your concern. Every city manager is an elected official. Every district attorney is an elected official. Every police chief serves at the pleasure of a mayor who is an elected official. So listen, there's stuff you can do. You just got to do it. And it's not easy because listen, if it were easy, everybody would do it, right? I hope starting this new year, starting this new decade, that we all together do whatever it is you can in your little corner. I'm doing what I can right here in this little space right here to try to make a difference. And I'm sharing with you what it is that I'm doing and what I think might be helpful if you were to try to do this so that we can make a difference. Because it's not one thing that's gonna change um, the situation. It's, it's so institutionalized. It's so embedded in the culture. It's gonna be a multifaceted approach and it's gonna take, well, Lottie Dottie and everybody to play their part. I'm also um, you know, gonna be talking to, and so I'll just say it here, I'm reaching out to Senator Stephen Bradford um, up in Sacramento because he was very involved in AB 392 and you know, we've been some places together and he says he's a shit starter. So I just, I just wanna see for myself because there's some things that I think as a legislator, he might help or at least if he can't do it, might help point in the direction of someone who can. And so again, having said all that, I'm not political. Um, that's not what I do. But if uh, you know you have family or if you know someone, um, what did you say, Thais? Oakland is truly a tale of two cities. Yeah, it's a hot mess. I think it's really just a tale of one city. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a mess. But um, again, if you know young people who may be politically inclined and want to run for office, because since the city manager is the one who's allowing all this foolishness to go on in, in um, Vallejo, what I suggested um, to my uh, sister soldier, Jamila, uh, is to, you know, let's see if we can find somebody who would want to be the city manager, be that person who has a police chief serving at your pleasure on Vallejo Police Department and see if you can't make a difference that way because listen, 
the fish rots from the head. And I say all the time that, you know, corruption, institutionalized racism is top down. And top down, I mean, city manager, in the case of Vallejo, I mean, police chiefs, I mean, captains, lieutenants, and sometimes sergeants before you get to the ground pounders, to the police officers who are chasing people and pulling up and parking outside of their house and shining the light up in the window because they feel some kind of way because you had the temerity to complain about having a loved one killed or beaten up because they arrest you with impunity for resisting, interfering like they do, like I showed on my Instagram um, account videos of officers in Vallejo, there was a young man, uh, Adrian Burrell, he had a cousin pull up in his driveway on a motorcycle and he was concerned for his cousin. So he stepped outside to videotape what the officer was doing because the officer pulled up all crazy, aggressive, <laughs> and uh, pointed his gun at his cousin. And so Adrian Burrell is, is, is videotaping it and the officer, you know, because he's Billy Badass, he had to stop what he was doing with the man on the motorcycle and he looked up on the porch and he sees the guy videoing and he says, you know, you're interfering. <laughs> and then he, t he tells the guy on the motorcycle, just wait here, I'll be back. And he redirects his attention to the gentleman up on the porch. So you know what happened when he got up on the porch. Thankfully, Mr. Burrell complied and complained. He's got an attorney. And uh, you hear the officer, you see the video where the officer's saying, Quit resisting. And you can hear Burrell very calmly saying, I'm not resisting. Quit fighting me. You're going to jail now. And he goes, I'm not fighting you. And then the officer kicks his legs out from under him and knocks him down to the ground. And at that point, you can no longer see the video. But guess what happened? He was arrested for what? Interfering. Charges were dropped, but he was arrested for that. And so that's how they get down in Vallejo. And so, I, you know, every time I see it, I'll be talking about it like I do Florida because, you know, Florida is the gift that keeps on giving too. So uh, Vallejo PD, we're coming for you. Be ready. I want to share one other thing with you that came across my um, Facebook timeline. Um, this is something that I didn't know about it. So listen, I got this iPhone because my kids told me for the longest I was an Android girl and they said, you don't need an iPhone and I'm constantly learning about things that my phone does. And then I get mad when my millennials, you know, I'm, I'm proud and I tell them, Hey, guess what I could do on my phone. And then they're like, oh, yeah, we know. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you knew and you didn't tell me what's up. So I just found out a new thing. And this is really important, particularly females. A woman uh, was spared a rape because of this feature. So, um, anybody, but particularly females, tell your young people, boys and girls, about this feature. Uh, it's on the iPhone, and it's the SOS feature. And uh, what happened is, is that um, this guy tried to attack this lady. He came up to her, and he gave some lame excuse about he lost his phone, and she went to go help him look for it. And he asked if he could use her phone once he kind of got her off to a secluded area. And then she realized, ooh wee. Um, this don't seem right because he don't even know how to turn the damn phone on. He had an iPhone that he lost and he don't know how to work mine. So somehow she was able to get her phone back from him. But at that point, the fight was on. And so what she did was she hit the volume button. It says if you hold the power and volume button down at the same time, or you can tap the power button five times consecutively, if you do that, it will automatically do the SOS. It will activate the SOS feature. And when she did that, when she hit that, she either held down the uh, volume and power or she did the five times rapid succession on the power button, it, it contacted authorities and police were able to come right to her location while this guy was in the midst of attacking her. So this is really, um, you know, this is a really important feature to know about. Again, there's an SOS feature on the iPhone. Tap the power button five times and it will activate the um, SOS. And you don't even have to say anything, just do that. And you know what? I think I kind of did that the other day because I was doing something on my phone. <laughs> I think I did it about, 
I must have hit it five times, not even realizing what I was doing. And then all of a sudden this red lettering came on my phone and I think it beeped and I was like, what the hell? And so I had to just hurry up and hit the, <laughs> I'm trying to hit something. I was having a senior moment to make, <laughs> to make sure that I deactivated. So it does work. Share that with your young people. These kids all have phones now, even in the fourth and fifth grade, tell them if you're ever somewhere and you're in an emergency situation, if you're being attacked, if you're being uh, bullied and you need assistance, not now, but right now, you don't even have to say a word. Hit that power button five times quickly and it will activate the SOS feature. So family, that's it for now. Um, see you next week here on Facebook Live. Subbies, I'll see you on the upload. And then Instagram, you'll be seeing me. I'm almost like I've got an addiction because I've got this whole situation set up now with this recording. And uh, I am just excited to share with the Instagram family. So Instagram, you'll be seeing a whole lot of me uh, just doing one story topics. Something I want to share with you real quick, uh, something you need to know, something I want to update you on. And um, so um, look for me. Sergeant Dorsey speaks on YouTube. Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey on Instagram. Visit my website, sgtcheryldorsey.com. Follow, subscribe to my podcast, Sergeant Dorsey Speaks. I, um, I almost need a list of stuff that I'm doing um, so that you can find me. And if all else fails, I'm like somebody I saw on TV who said one time, if you want to know who I am, just Google me. I can't say her name because I don't, you know, say her name. But um, yeah, yeah, you can find me. Hashtag tell a friend, follow me, subscribe, like, and I will see you guys on next week. Until next time, family, be good and be safe.